Uh, today's uh, seminar is very important, uh, very timely. Uh, my name is Sayyid Tariq Anwar. I'm a professor at WT. Uh, we have a very good speaker, Mr. Chris Stewart. Uh, we first had a seminar with him uh, 2000. So he's coming back. But before I introduce him, uh, I would like you uh, uh, to uh, have a few in some information about social media law. That's the topic and the title he has, Protecting the Public or Censorship. And uh, before I start this, social media is a very, very diverse topic. It applies to almost every country we deal with. Every country. It's truly global. There are 194 countries in the world. Of course, there are more than 200, but 194, these are all established, well-recognized. And uh, social media is available everywhere. I travel overseas every year, and I can see all the developments. Uh, social media is made up of social networks, apps, discussion forums, blogging, online relationships, online shopping, uh, keep on adding, uh, and every year it will uh, keep on growing. Uh, I just uh, collected some data this morning and I would like to uh, uh, share it uh, uh, with you. Uh, the main companies in social media are Facebook, and then uh, we have uh, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google. These are called uh, FANGs, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google. And then from China, we have uh, Baidu and uh, Alibaba. Uh, I looked at, uh, at uh, 9 a.m. today. Uh, Facebook market value is $869 billion. Think about for a second. And they have close to 3 billion subscribers worldwide. I don't have a Facebook account. Most of you have. But uh, I look at it uh, on the operational issues. Uh, Apple today, its market value, 9 a.m., $2.25 trillion. Think about it for a second. When we went to school, we did not have that. Uh, Amazon is $1.68 trillion. Netflix is $245 billion. Google is $1.5 trillion, still growing. I mean, we can have this discussion forever, but uh, there is uh, so much information available uh, on, uh, in the, on the topic of social media that is mind-boggling. Uh, I read uh, yesterday some of, the some of the people also made a uh, lot of articles about this. People wrote poetry. People have everything on social media. Uh, social media is a social circus. It's a closed coliseum. Uh, it's always available. It has a lot of legal problems. That's why Mr. Chris Stewart is here. It has IP issues, intellectual property. It deals with the public censorship. It's a recipe to kill time, but it has some issues also. Uh, markets are truly global, social media. I was looking at uh, today, Facebook is barely 17 years old. And you can see its market value is reaching $1 trillion. So uh, 17 years old, and uh, we never saw something like this. So this is where uh, my brief introduction goes. Uh, let me introduce to you our uh, special guest, Mr. Chris Stewart. Uh, he, he's our own, WT's own. He graduated in 1992 with the magna cum laude. Then he went on to University of Nebraska, and he did his uh, JD degree. He's a successful, established lawyer attorney in Amarillo, and his main area is uh, trademark and all the issues. I will let him uh, uh, explain to you all the things he has done, but one data I have here, uh, Chris has his team, they have obtained 600 plus trademarks. And uh, that's a very good record in uh, the panhandle of Texas. But uh, again, uh, please uh, hold on to your questions. Uh, he has a very good uh, presentation. And uh, again, thanks for coming. And uh, let's give a warm welcome to our own Mr. Chris Stewart. Two uh, recent events highlight uh, the power that uh, just a few social media companies have to influence the public debate 
or even control it. Uh, and some say these social media companies, when they exercise this power, are protecting the public. And others would say they're engaging in censorship and even stifling the public debate. I want to talk about two recent examples you're probably all very familiar with. Uh, the first example is the takedown of Donald Trump's Twitter account. I want to start there. On February the uh, 8th of this year, Twitter announced that they were permanently suspending the then president's Twitter account. And if you look at Twitter's statement as to why they took this action, they point to two tweets by the president. I want to read these to you. This is the first tweet that Twitter pointed to. The president tweeted, the 75 million great American patriots who voted for me, America first, and make America great again, will have a giant voice long into the future. They will not be disrespected or treated unfairly in any way, shape, or form. That was the first tweet. The second tweet came out a little, the same day, a little bit after that, and it said this, quote, to all of those who have asked, I will not be going to the inauguration on January the 20th. Those are the two tweets that Twitter pointed to. The Twitter statement about these two tweets, it points to these two tweets, but it says these tweets have to be considered in context of everything else that was going on at the time. Twitter also pointed to the fact that they had to consider how other people were using the information in these tweets to push their own agendas. Based on that, Twitter makes the decision to permanently suspend the president's Twitter account. Jack Dorsey of Twitter seemed to acknowledge the precedent that was being set here. He referred to it as a dangerous precedent, highlighting the power of an individual or corporation has over a part of the global public conversation. Second example, the takedown of anti-vaccine information. According to the Congressional Research Service, the spread of COVID-19 misinformation complicated the public health response to COVID-19. In, January, in a January 22nd, 2021 article, CNBC reported that a group of Democratic senators wrote to the CEOs of the major uh, social media companies in the United States, asking them to crack down on what they considered to be vaccine misinformation. And the social media companies explained how they dealt with this vaccine information. Here was Facebook's position. Facebook said that ads promoting the vaccine and how to safely access it would be allowed. Content seeking to exploit the pandemic for commercial gain would continue to be prohibited. Ads or organic posts claiming to sell the vaccine would be rejected as would false claims uh, about the vaccines if those claims had been debunked by health experts. That was Facebook's position. Google's position, they detailed how they were going to be surfacing the accurate uh, COVID information and provide a list of places where you could get the vaccine. Google announced that it had given $250 million in ad grants on its platform for governments to push out public service announcements um, related to the virus. They also invested several million dollars in fact-checking initiatives related to virus information. On YouTube, they took steps to make what they deemed reliable sources appear higher in search results and limited recommendations of what they called borderline content that approaches prohibited behavior, they knocked that down in, the, in their search results on YouTube. Twitter has its whole entire policy that it calls its COVID-19 misleading information policy. 
Twitter's policy warns about persistent conspiracy theories, alarmist rhetoric unfounded in research or credible reporting, and a wide range of unsubstantiated rumors. Things deemed to violate this COVID-19 misinformation policy include tweets that make adverse comments on the impact or effects of receiving the vaccine. Tweets about personal protective equipment, such as claims about the efficacy and safety of face masks. You can't comment on preventative measures such as hand washing, prior, proper hygiene or sanitation methods or social distancing. Th those are negative comments about those things. Or make negative comments about negative tweets about local or national advisories or mandates relating to curfews, lockdowns, travel restrictions, quarantine protocols, and inoculations. Is Twitter protecting the public or engaging in censorship? Welcome to social media law today. It's at the forefront. I've been talking about social media law for a number of years and I just totally changed this presentation because of these current news stories. Everything we're talking about is stuff that's happened this year. I think the power of social media companies to really control the public debate, the public discourse, has really come to the forefront in a new way. And I wanna put it under the microscope and I wanna talk about the law here. We're gonna learn about how social media companies have broad authority to police or even not to police content as they see fit. They rely on vague policies. We'll talk about how they pick and choose what stays and what goes. We'll learn about the inconsistencies. The law of social media changing all the time just continues to morph. Thank you, Dr. Anwar, for having me here today. I really appreciate it. It's great to be here. I wanna thank Tanya for helping me put together the, the presentation and the, and the notes today. Now, some people, they, when, when they see or hear these news stories about how Donald Trump has been expelled from Twitter and all this, uh, you know, maybe a belief that, that they're censoring anything that's anti-vaccination content may jump to the conclusion that social media should be a free-for-all. They should be able to get to say whatever you want to say. Uh, and to that, I would say not so fast. I think there tends to be this kind of general disagreement that you can't just put whatever you want out on social media. That there's some certain categories of content that we ought to restrict, that there ought to be regulations on, and that we really kind of have this expectation that social media companies will police. I call these the easy categories, where the stuff that's being promoted, the content would be maybe illegal or at least close to it. And here's the list that I compiled. Uh, you know, content that promotes self-harm or suicide, threats to child safety, Mainstream uh, social media, it would be pornography or graphic violence, uh, scams or, or spam, uh, theft of intellectual property, bullying or harassment content. There seems to be a general consensus that this stuff we don't want to see on mainstream media. I don't see a lot of people having heartburn about this kind of content being restricted on your mainstream platforms. Uh, it, and, and so even, it, we'll talk about reforms of, of the law, but even those reforms still, there seems to be an appreciation that there will be carve-outs for this kind of content. From there, I think it gets a little more blurry. The categories of stuff that might be prohibited by these social media companies, the lines just get a little more blurry. And what we have here are policies that are written by the social media companies themselves that then define what is prohibited. For example, here's one of those policies. This is a part of the Facebook policy on false news. Now you would think, wouldn't you, that Facebook would be hypervigilant against false news. Remember the claims after the 2016 presidential election that, were, that the Russians were pushing out all sorts of, sorts of false content on Facebook that may have had some sort of an influence on the election, right? 
So you would think that Facebook draws some hardline stance. Well, here's what their policy says. Facebook recognizes that false news is a challenging and sensitive issue. We want to help people stay informed without stifling productive public discourse. There's also a fine line between false news and satire or opinion. For these reasons, we do not remove false news from Facebook, but instead significantly reduce its distribution by showing it lower in the news feed. Here's another one of their policies. This is the one on hate speech. And it falls in, under Facebook's rules, this falls under a broader category of objectionable content. Now, I think we can all agree that hate speech is a bad thing. The problem is how do you define it? What is hate speech? And, and Facebook makes an attempt to define what hate speech is. I'm not gonna go over that definition today. It's just difficult to define. And it's almost like we know it when we see it, you know, to, to, when we see it, we like, okay, yeah, that's hate speech. And something's triggered in us that says that, but defining it, a little more difficult. These policies give the appearance that there are hard and fast rules. They sow into this belief, maybe even a dream, that there's these hard and fast rules and these bright lines about what's prohibited and what's not. When the truth is, that's not the case, and there is a ton of gray areas. Here's what I really want you to know about these policies. These policies are written by the social media companies themselves, who also themselves interpret those policies and are also responsible for enforcing those policies and whether or not they have been violated. If you practice law in this field and you're trying to work with Facebook or whatever social media company it is, uh, trying to get them to remove content and pointing them to their own policies, it, it can be very unpredictable about what they are going to take down and what they're going to leave up. They're calling the shots. They are definitely calling the shots. So when you ask me, what is the law of social media? I would tell you it is driven by policies that these social media companies write, interpret, and enforce. And as you will learn later in this talk, and I'm gonna give you the legal basis why, it doesn't even really matter legally if they get it wrong. The next thing I want to talk about is how do social media companies go about flagging content for removal, either, either flagging it for the little warning label that you see sometimes, have you seen that? The warning label that you see, or flag it to totally remove it. I want to talk about the process in which they undertake. They rely upon three sources to flag or remove content. The first resource they rely upon is users. You've seen this, right? You're looking at a post and you can flag the content. And typically that's with a pull down menu and they give you these kind of forced options that indicate why you think this content is objectionable. You've seen, you know what I'm talking about, you've seen this before. Well, when it comes to this potential viewpoint discrimination, like I don't like what you're saying, the potential always exists and it's a flaw of the system. Somebody doesn't like the content, they flag it. They say this is objectionable, it's not true, or any other objection they might be able to identify. They then get their friends, their social media friends, their cohorts to, hey, let's all go to this content that we really don't like and let's flag it as objectionable for some reason. The flaw with that system is it doesn't know the motivation of the person who's flagging the content. Make sense? And more and more of these algorithms, it's getting drawn to the attention of the social media company. The more people that flag the content, the more likely it's going to get a label of a warning or even get taken down. It's a flawed system for the flagging the content. It doesn't get into the motivation of the person who's flagging it. The second tool they use are content moderators. This strikes me as fascinating. These are human beings who are actually looking at the content and then flagging it. 
Uh, I wasn't aware of this, but as I was pre uh, preparing for this presentation, there's actually kind of uh, groups that are coming together, almost like an industry of folks called fact checkers. They're actually, their job is to basically fact check claims that are being made. I want to pause here and just ask uh, what's really a rhetorical question. What does it say about our world that we need fact checkers? I think it's an interesting question. What does it say about our world that we even need fact checkers? What does it say about the information that's traveling on the internet and social media that we need fact checkers? I think it's a good question and I think it's an important question. I think it raises interesting issues about our society as a whole that we need fact checkers but it's really coming to the forefront. This is a picture from the global conference of the International Fact-Checking Network. I, I had no idea there were conferences devoted to fact-checking. The International Fact-Checking Network was launched back in September of 26, 2015, that surprised me, to support the booming industry almost of the fact-checking initiatives. They monitor trends, formats, and policy making about fact checking worldwide. They help identify common positions among the world's fact checkers. It goes to Dr. Anwar's point about how social media is so international. They feel there's a need that for an international coordination among fact checkers around the world as messages can be spread worldwide in a viral manner in a matter of moments. These fact checkers convene every year in a yearly conference and promote collaborative efforts for international fact checking. Twitter has recently announced a pilot program called Birdwatch that is like community sourced fact checking. And what Twitter is doing is developing a website. They've, they've got a website separate from Twitter where commenters provide context to certain posts that have been flagged necessary context, like here's additional information you need to know, sort of information to, that would go along with tweets. This is hosted separately from the main Twitter page because they're in, like I said, it's currently a pilot program. They're trying to figure out what kind of contextual information is most helpful for users on Twitter when evaluating claims that are being tweeted. An example of a kind of a community-based program around fact-checking. Big element of fact-checking right now is actually driven by artificial intelligence. All of the main social media companies are using artificial intelligence to flag and moderate content. Works in some cases better than others. The problem with artificial intelligence is it's not good at reflecting content or in uh, context or intent. And I'll give you some real life examples of that here in a little bit. And sometimes AI is gonna catch stuff that shouldn't be caught and sometimes it's gonna miss things. In certain areas of content, it's very effective. In others, not so effective. According to the Congressional Research Service, AI technology flagged 99% of violent and graphic content and child nudity on Facebook. 99%. Hey, that's a solid track record. Compare that to AI only effectively flagged 16% of content that was bullying and harassment. Not effective at all, a tool for that type of content. Depends on what the content is. For certain types of content, there has to be this emphasis on the human being, that actual content moderator. I think an interesting documentary I would recommend, I'm sure some of you have already seen it, on how social media companies use algorithms to feed you the information that's in your feed. Um, I like, the, I like, I found, I thought interesting, the, the social dilemma on Netflix, if you've seen that or haven't, I, su I would suggest that you watch it. I really liked it. I thought it was really informative. 
You know, this idea that we're all getting the same thing in our feed, uh, that's not the case at all. The video, the documentary really gets into that. I recommend it to you. So given how they're identifying content and giving, given the fact that these social media companies are writing their own policies, some can be different across the different social media companies, it shouldn't be surprising at all that different social media companies reach different decisions on whether certain content comes down or stays up. This was an, an article that appeared uh, on Slate.com June 17th, 2019, that talks about the inconsistencies, even among the social media platforms, to identify what content goes and what content stays. The uh, Dr. Uh, Nancy Pelosi, drunk, or Drunk Pelosi video is what it was called. You may remember this from, from a while back. Uh, Facebook had decided to leave it up, but added fact checker warnings, whereas YouTube took it down. Pinterest removes generally anti-vax content altogether, while Facebook uh, argues that it, cutting the dis distribution or reducing it in the feed is enough. Uh, Facebook allows posts that say the Holocaust is a hoax, but as of June of 2019, YouTube had not made the decision and you can still get that content. So even across social media platforms, there's inconsistency on how the rules are applied. Let's move now to the issue of irony or satire or parody. Artificial intelligence doesn't even come close to working here. I saw this article, recent article in the New York Times that I thought I really liked the title of this article. I think it kind of sums it all up. It says, for political cartoonists, the irony was that Facebook didn't recognize irony. And this article talks about this, this person that's pictured here is a political cartoonist. And I'm gonna show you one of his political cartoons in a second that just got taken, that got taken down. Uh, the whole point of the article is that these companies, that they're just not equipped to deal with these issues of nuance and satire and, and parody. But this artist, his cartoons were getting taken down as violating particular, particular policies. And this is one of those cartoons. I want to share it with you. Now, give me, let me give you a little bit of context here. This is two, two panels from a nine-panel cartoon. In the first part of the cartoon, it's two doctors and they're in a medical lab and they're talking about coronavirus. And they're discussing, well, I think we should, how about we come up with a, this idea of a mask? And they're basically, they're talking about a face mask, right? That we're all wearing. They're talking about face masks and they're going, this is a great idea. Who should we present this idea to, to so that we can develop this national response? These doctors decide we should present this to the president of the United States. That's where our cartoon takes over here. In, this, in these two panels, we've got our two doctors with their face masks presenting this idea to presumably President Trump, to which he says, I don't like it, makes you look weak. In the next panel, we have a person who looks somewhat like Mike Pence saying, yeah, it makes you look weak. And then the person who looks to me like Donald Trump Jr. maybe says, get out of here, libtards to which the doctors reply, oh well, back to the lab. This cartoon got taken down. Well now, why would this cartoon get taken down? Is it sending an anti-mask message? I don't think so. I think it's making fun of the Trump administration's position on masks, maybe? You get the point. The point of the cartoon was, you know, to point out the irony of the situation. This gets, this gets taken down, an example of not really appreciating the point that's being made. Here's another example. This came from the Babylon Bee. This is a satire, a Christian satire uh, website. They, the original article had this title. It says, CNN purchases industrial-sized washing machine to spin news before publication. It's got a picture of a washing machine with the CNN logo on it. They 
put this out on Facebook with the, under the quote, spin for five minutes on high and you'll have yourselves a news story. Snopes.com actually reported that this news story was false. Well, of course it was false. It's a parody. It wasn't intended to be true. Another example of where current systems maybe aren't quite up to snuff, right, for the job of content moderation. The article from the beginning was intended as a joke. I want to stop here for a second and ask, I get this a lot, well, what about the First Amendment? How can the social media companies do this when we've got the First Amendment? Isn't this free speech, right? The answer is no. Why? Why isn't this a free speech issue? Because the social media companies are private actors. They're not government actors, right? The First Amendment prohibits the government from stifling speech as a general rule. We're here, we're talking about private entities. The First Amendment here does not apply in this situation. If these were government actors, different situation. Just always want to clarify, I get that, get asked that a lot. A couple of cartoons I found that I thought were good to kind of illustrate the situation we find ourselves in. One has Donald Trump uh, being masked or silenced or censored, if you will, by some of the largest social media companies. The other one shows Uncle Sam trying to escape from a computer screen that is trying to gobble him up. Uh, got icons there for Twitter and Facebook on it. I thought those were good kind of illustrated um, illustrations of the current situation that we find ourselves in. So what's the legal basis for these social media companies? And I think it's fair to say, well, I hope I've made the case, these social media companies are calling the shots. You agree with that? They're definitely calling the shots about what stays or what, go, what goes. What's the legal basis for them to do that? It's section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. This section gives broad protection or immunity to social media companies to push out content that's been developed by third parties. They have broad immunity. They have immunity if they take content down. They have immunity if they leave content up. They have immunity if they are right. They have immunity if they are wrong. Social media companies cannot generally be held legally liable for the third party content on their platforms. Now, without a doubt, section 230 was a great contributor, excuse me, to the growth of the internet, right? The internet is what it is in its relatively free flow of information because of section 230. The internet, in my opinion, would not be what it is today without section 230. These social media companies were able to grow and expand because they weren't worried about getting sued because of the content that was being pushed out by third parties on their social media sites. The question posed today is, has the landscape changed so much that section 230 should be done away with, amended, somehow changed. That's really the focus of where we are today. Recent events have led to a growing, shall we say, discourse, chorus of discontent over Section 230 immunity. The issue, though, or the problem is, advocates for change are on both sides of the coin. It's almost like everybody doesn't like it, but the reasons they don't like it are totally different. There are some people who say we should change Section 230 because these social media companies are out of control. 
They allege the social media companies of having an anti-conservative bias, that they're biased against conservative viewpoints, that they're biased against Donald Trump. That's one chorus. The other chorus you hear is the social media companies are not doing enough. They need to be restricting more content. They need to be restricting more than they are now. So everybody hates it, but in different directions, if you will, it's an issue of considerable controversy and is going to continue to be. President Biden is quoted in a January 11, 2021 article on NBCnews.com saying, I think, quote, I think social media should be more socially conscious in terms of what is important in terms of our democracy. Everything should not be about whether they can make a buck. A viewpoint in the direction they need to do more. In light of the current events we've seen even just this year, and I've outlined those at the beginning, we've had a number of federal legislators have put forth legislation that would amend Section 230. Some of these, the names of these bills struck me as quite funny because they telegraph the author's point of view. I could not resist but to share some of my favorites with you. We have the, and, and you can tell me, I'm going to read these to you. Are you able to guess what side of the debate they stand on? Stop the Censorship Act. Don't Push My Buttons Act. Protecting Americans from Dangerous Algorithms Act. Break Up Big Tech Act of 2020. The Online Freedom and Viewpoint Diversity Act. And Stop Suppressing Speech Act of 2020. This is just a handful of them. There have been, I'm just guessing, I'm visualizing the page in my mind, probably 30 different bills you know, as legislators wanting to get on front of this issue and stand up for their constituents and appeal to their party loyals, you know, I want to be at the forefront of this and I can't believe what happened to maybe President Trump or whatever uh, are trying to jump on the bandwagon. What's interesting to me is the social media companies themselves are getting in on this debate, the reform debate. And call me cynical, but it's very easy for me to see why the Facebook companies would want to get involved in the debate. If it's going to happen, they want to shape the direction that it goes. Does everybody think that might be the case? I definitely do. And they're thinking that reforming or jumping in on the reform debate over Section 230 is going to be a whole lot more palatable to them than some of the more drastic reforms we're going to talk about here in a little bit. Mark Zuckerberg's position on this is kind of interesting to me. Of course, he's with Facebook, and he described his position on the reforms. Remember, Section 230 is the one that gives them this really broad immunity. He says the liability protection should be conditional on the company's ability to meet best practices to stop the spread of this content. Instead of being granted immunity, platforms should be required to demonstrate that they have systems in place for identifying unlawful content and removing it. Platforms should not be held liable if a particular piece of content evades its detection, because that would be impractical for platforms with billions of posts per day. They should be required to have adequate systems in place to address unlawful content. So if you have a system in place and follow best practices, no liability. That sounds a lot like immunity to me. Don't know how you react to that, but that sounds a lot like immunity. He says, the immunity is conditional or instead of being granted immunity, but then explains they should not be held liable if a particular piece of content evades detection. According to a March 26, 2021 article on CNET.com, Evan Greer, director of Fight for the Future, an organization 
that advocates for more net neutrality, online privacy, and security kind of calls out Facebook. He says it's no surprise that Facebook supports change to Section 230 since altering the law would benefit the company. Quote, Zuckerberg's support for changes to Section 230 is about maintaining Facebook's dominance and monopoly control, nothing more. Instead of helping Facebook by gutting Section 230, lawmakers should take actual steps to address the harms of big tech, like passing strong federal data privacy legislation, enforcing antitrust laws, and targeting harmful business practices like micro-targeting and non-transparent algorithmic manipulation. Suggesting, of course, a strong, even stronger stance should be taken. The growing chorus of voices include uh, U.S. Supreme Court Justice uh, Clarence Thomas, who's argued that social media companies should be regulated because of their power to stifle the public discussion. Even the states are getting involved. Texas is getting involved. Texas is right there among the states pushing for reform. According to Texas Governor Greg Abbott, quote, big tech's efforts to censor conservative viewpoints is un-American, and we are not going to allow it in the Lone Star State. Senate Bill 12 here in Texas would prohibit social media companies from blocking, banning, demonetizing, or otherwise discriminating against a user based on their viewpoint or their location within Texas. Under the proposal, a person who feels like they've been wrongly banned from a social media platform can file a lawsuit. They can file a claim in court. The Texas Attorney General can bring these claims. And if the social media company fails to comply, the law provides, or the bill, shall I say, provides that the court can impose daily penalties. Now the state's jumping into the issue of internet content raises whole other issues of whether the response should be from the federal government or even potentially 50 different states all trying to regulate internet content. I'm not sure what that would look like. We could have a whole nother talk on that subject, but whether the state should get involved, that's a whole nother level of controversy. So the Congressional uh, Research Service talks about some other possible solutions to the problems that we've got, depending on your point of view, of course, on social media companies and the power that they have. One of the proposals is to treat social media companies almost like uh, public utilities. The analogy here is almost like the utility company, right? The utility company is not the government, right? The government doesn't own the utility, but the government uh, would have the ability to, of course, heavily regulate it. So this would be kind of your heavy regulation scenario. Now, I think an interesting question that this poses is, if the government starts regulating social media companies like this, are there now potential First Amendment issues or the free speech issues? Because remember, right now, free speech, the protections of the First Amendment don't apply because these are not government actors. But suppose the government does start regulating on that level. I think there's real free speech concerns that then come to the forefront. Another proposal, antitrust actions. Have the social media companies become so big that we should consider antitrust remedies to break up the social media conglomerates, break up Facebook? The argument would be they have such a stranglehold on content that the best scenario for the consumer or more healthy, robust content moderation would be for these big social media companies to be broken up so that there's real competition in this marketplace in the field of content moderation. It's another idea that's gaining some, some traction. Uh, Google's been under the antitrust microscope for a number of years. Uh, be interesting to see if that movement begins to take a little bit of hold here. The last proposal is to set up some sort of an advisory, not a regulatory federal entity. Maybe to study the problem, make recommendations, work with social media companies to identify authoritative sources of information on topics of public 
concern. That's another uh, idea that's been tossed around. I think it only appropriate that I end our time today uh, in my prepared remarks with some predictions of my own and what, where I think this is going to go. Uh, and that is this. I don't think we are going to see any major overhaul of Section 230. I don't think we'll see any major overhaul. Why do I say that? I do not see the political momentum going one way long enough for there to be any major overhaul of the law. You've got too many competing voices. Some saying, this is, this is biased against the conservatives. We need to restrict their power. Others saying they need more power. I don't see the political momentum going in one direction long enough and fast enough. Now, there may be some minor tweaks to it, but they're going to fall in the category of minor tweak. Enough for that politician to go back and say, look how I took on the social media company, but I don't think you're going to see any major overhaul. My last prediction is these social media companies themselves will be actively involved in the quote-unquote solution. They are going to be at the table at every turn, advocating for what they want. I don't know if any of you noted how much money those social media companies poured into the last election cycle. Uh, they poured in a lot of money. I'll just leave it at that. A lot of that money tended to go one particular way in the stories that I was hearing, of course. They are going to have a seat at the table. They're going to insist on it. And it's going to continue to be a situation where the regulated social media company continues to be the regulator. Thanks for listening. I'm glad you came. Let's open this floor for your questions. We have a lot of time, about 15 minutes. Okay, so you're basically an attorney for social media? I do quite a bit of it in my practice. And it's, I seem to be getting more and more of it. Okay. So for all the big social media influencers and all that, do they, what's the word? Do they have to like trademark their name and trademark everything they do basically? So that way they don't get into legal actions like, you know? That's a great question. That's a good question. Um, and I think you're asking question relating to two different things. I think you're asking a trademark related question, and then I think you're asking a copyright related question. And I'll address both. Like to use a name or something, like they want to identify themselves not as their actual name, but maybe they have some sort of a, a, a title or name that they use, like a celebrity handle, if you know what I'm saying. That could potentially be an issue of trademark law, right? As long as they're the first to use it in, in a, in a and those would be called common law rights, they're free to use whatever that name is that they come up with, right? They, and they may, may or may not need to do a trademark search on that, but it's not required that they go through some sort of a trademark process. And then on, as far as the content they're pushing out, content legally tends to be driven by issues of copyright law. Right? That's what protects their content. And typically, you're not seeing that content be, shall we say, vetted on the front end. I mean, as long as they're writing original content, that's going to be protected. As long as they're pushing out somebody else's content, that's probably going to be protected too. I have argued for years, and I think this is supported by terms and conditions of all the social media companies. If you put something out on social media, you are granting a license to the world to repost that information. And their terms of use will tell you that, right? Now, I have seen cases where people are taking that information and reposting it, and then they're getting sued for it for copyright infringement. I'm not saying people don't threaten it, because they do threaten it. It does happen from time to time. But for the most part, as long as it's their original content or they're re-pushing out somebody else's content, it's probably going to be probably going to be fair game. Your question is a good one. It hits on a lot of different topics. I can only scratch the surface of it. Does that help? Okay.
Good. It's a great question. What else? I was wondering about false information. Yes. It would seem like most information anyone says isn't very, like, it's either just opinionated. So how would you, like, decide what's specifically false information or just an opinion someone's putting out there? It, that is, I would love to hear your answer to that question because there's all sorts of gray about that. There's all sorts of gray. I think a lot of information that some people consider false is truly just someone's opinion. And it's not enough just to say, in my opinion, fill in the blank. I mean, that happens a lot. The line between opinion and fact, I think, is a very, very difficult one. I, I can't even begin to give an answer. To me, I, don't you think, in, in my opinion, I think the uh, Facebook post, the, the Facebook policies on false news just kind of sum it up. It's almost like... What is their policy? I read it to you today. After you heard that, were you like, what exactly is your policy on fake news? And you would think they'd be like way on top of it. It's be, it's, they point out that this is a difficult and sensitive issue. I can't help but agree with that. And it's a difficult and sensitive issue, I think in part for, the, for what your question you know, suggests. That line, ton of, ton of gray area there for sure. Chris, I have a question for you. So since this is an international class, we deal with global issues, multinational corporations. I mean, we are talking about the uh, United States. Uh, imagine dealing with 194 countries. What do you see happening down the road in the next five, six years? I mean, uh, do, do we have some kind of a regulatory body at the global level? Because it's kind of going out of control. I think it's a great question. It's a fair question for what we're seeing these days. I, I don't see how, absent some sort of a coordinated, and I don't know what this looks like, Dr. Omar, of course, but absent some sort of coordinated international effort, I mean, it's, it's a hodgepodge. And the, in the United States, for the most part, I mean, we still don't have any, I think a good example of, of the hindered response is there still has not been any real traction toward federal digital privacy. You've got right now this hodgepodge of states that have their own laws. Well, how's that going to work? If, you know, Virginia regulates it one way and Texas does it another way, how, how does that work? How, if you're a social media company, how would you respond to that? So what tends to happen is we tend to, we lawyers, we tend to gravitate toward like what's the most restrictive is what we tend to do. In, as far as worldwide, we're advising clients in the United States based upon European Union privacy rules. Why? Because that's the most restrictive. We feel like it's the safest course. It is a, kind of a weird situation where we're advising our clients to comply with EU privacy laws because they're just the most restrictive. It's hard without a coordinated sort of an effort. Where's it gonna go? There needs to be this kind of consensus that we really need, a, I think, a global response. It's, it's way lacking right now. This international kind of movement on even fact-checking, it's slow to, slow to materialize for sure. You know, the new rules are that uh, there is an effort to put uh, tax on uh, multinational corporation and United States uh, Department of Treasury is at the forefront and it's a collection of all the countries, although it hasn't been decided, but it's on the table. And so that's why I asked this question. Uh, uh, it's getting to be a kind of a complex issue. It is. There's a lot of interrelatedness. We've been, a, as you know, more than anyone, we're interconnected. Uh, we don't want to become unconnected, but how to deal with the regulatory issues that arise from the landscape, it's, it's hard to do, hard to coordinate for sure. Other questions, comments? Uh, because, uh, yeah, go ahead. I did have a question. I thought it was really no, interesting. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. No, I thought... did speak up. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought it was very interesting how you mentioned that it wasn't necessarily a First Amendment issue because 
the government isn't directly involved in the social media companies. Um, but if they were to reform the 230 bill, and if, I guess, whenever you were talking about possible alternatives, making it like a public utilities type of thing where the government would be more involved. So how would that, so that would make it a First Amendment issue then if they were involved? Well, I think there, I think the argument I would make is at that point, you've got state action. You've got the state dictating what the social media company has to take down. And anytime you've got the government saying, we're going to take down one viewpoint over another viewpoint, that's what's going to trigger First Amendment issues. That's how I see that playing out. And I get, I get nervous, I guess, the idea of the government deciding what content goes or stays. That works great when you support the government's position. It doesn't work so great when you're on the outside of that or the administration changes. Uh, obviously, we could talk pros and cons about that, to which some people would say, well, I trust the government more than I trust Facebook. I get that point of view, too. Uh, so you've kind of got this lone, the, what feels like Lone Ranger to me, social media companies calling the shots. Uh, but then I think it's interesting, particularly the COVID-19 stuff. Could you argue that social media companies are in cahoots with the federal government now and in, in spreading this, you know, it's all about the vaccine sort of deal. I've had clients get caught in this net where they've been asked to take down some of their content to promote their products because they think it's the government, the FDA thinks it's counter to the government's position. You know, you can't be advocating. It's really hard right now on social media to be advocating anything other than you need to go get vaccinated. Proposing anything else, a remedy, a herbal supplement in order to help build your immunity. If you're tying that to COVID, FDA, FDA's got special task force that's dealing with that. We're communicating back and forth with FDA on this issue a lot. It's starting to sound more like the government's calling the shots. I'm kind of interested. I haven't seen a case yet that argues whether that's a violation of First Amendment rights. I haven't seen a case that addresses it, but I wouldn't be surprised if one was filed. I thought it was interesting in the statistics I was reading that Google gave, the gov gave governments 200, a quarter of a billion dollars, as I read the statistic, a quarter of a billion dollars to run free ads on Google pushing public service announcements written by the government. Is that government action? Maybe, I don't know. Or is it just a gift from Google? Depends on how you look at it, I guess. Other questions, comments? Well, uh, thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. And, uh, I would like to uh, make some uh, final comments. Uh, it was a wonderful it was a wonderful session, but uh, I would like to share with you a few comments. But before we do that, uh, there are a few books which have been published in the media. And uh, it, uh, these are uh, six, seven, eight years ago. I mean, uh, ago. Uh, here comes everybody. This is a book. It was uh, on the New York uh, Times, the bestseller. This is another one, uh, Connected. We are all connected. And it doesn't matter where you live. And the third book. I would like to uh, show you Digital Dividends, since this is international class. It was published by the World Bank, and it uh, showed up in their World Development Report 2016. Consider reading it. These are all available online. It has excellent information. Of course, thousands of books have been published on this topic, what uh, Chris uh, mentioned today. So, this article from a law journal, I'm going to read the title, Consumers' Obsession Becoming Retailers' Possession. So whatever you do online, uh, somebody is using that data. It's becoming a wild west. I mean, it's becoming a wild west. It is becoming an algorithmic society. That's what we discussed. And uh, it doesn't matter where you live, regardless of your location in this world. 194 countries, and there are more countries uh, behind the scene. 
And uh, it is truly a consumer's uh, social voice. And we can keep on discussing this, but hopefully we will have either half day or one day seminar next semester because this is a never ending topic. You can't fix it, discuss it. You can't dissect it in just uh, one hour. Uh, hopefully we will uh, invite you back, but uh, hopefully we will have uh, another session, but that will be at least uh, uh, four to five hours because our job as a higher education institution is also to help our community and beyond. And now internet is available. Uh, this video, which uh, is being uh, fixed today, it will be watched worldwide. So we live in a very small world, but at the same time, we are living in a universe. Uh, we don't know our boundaries. And this is where, when I go and travel overseas, uh, we see the same situation. But thank you so much, Chris. Uh, thank you for giving your uh, precious time. Uh, it, it has been very nice. And uh, people who are online and... Uh, Thank you again, uh, WD staff, uh, for coming here and our students. But uh, this is a never-ending topic. We will continue to discuss it. And I hope you benefited. And uh, thanks so much again.